podcast called uh, Dove Jelly Slim Podcast. He probably doesn't remember this at all. We yeah, record together. It's easy. This is kind of real. Like, holy shit. And so it's really cool to get to be a part of that. Hey, you know how this go. Hey, when you... You now tune into the biggest ever. When I hit you to take part, when I hit to take over. <laughs> I don't remember that. That's crazy. What's up, everyone? We're back with episode 138 of the Depth Test Podcast. Today, a very special guest, NFL guard, Cole Toner. Cole, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, so I know, obviously, you, you're dealing with a little bit of an injury. Um, but what what's the first part of this offseason kind of looking like for you? And just being able to have the chance to just kind of, like, decompress and be like, all right. Yeah, that's exactly what you do after yep, after a long NFL season. You got you have to decompress. Um it's a little bit different this time. I got this this yeah. cast on. I, I broke my thumb in the third to last game. So um, there's some pins in it right now, and I'm getting those pins taken out here on Monday. And so it's been – usually it's kind of good timing just because usually, like you said, you decompress. You take about, I don't know, one, two, three weeks to just hang out, rest up. Um, so in that process, this ended up being okay because I was going to kind of take some time off anyway. But – um, right now, just kind of, I, I travel a bit. I'm go, I'm in California right now, visiting visiting a girlfriend, and going to go to Indy uh, after I'm from it. I'm from Indy, so going to come back um, after I get these pins taken out in Houston, and I'll be back there soon for a few weeks. That's kind of the plan, and then I'll start working out again, hopefully in about two or three weeks. That sounds great. Um, but yeah, I, it is it is good timing, but also there's so many guys that are getting surgeries and and get things fixed up right now like I mean maybe the most notable ones like Baker Mayfield playing through a torn labrum right he just got surgery and I think that happened to him like uh, week three or four like it's it's crazy first of all it's crazy how how long the season is in the NFL just because I mean you have guys like Cam Akers who you know, tore his Achilles <laughs> I think was it in summer or in camp and he's back yeah. so if he I mean that's that's like beyond human recovery i think but um i mean good for him but like that's that's rare but you know you can get injured during the season and come back and and be productive for a whole for a playoff run for a whole second half of the season so but yeah once the season's over if guys if guys have played a lot of games it's you you tend to have some wear and tear and you go get that fixed up well i remember when adrian peterson tours acl he came back in what like eight months and people were blown away and i mean there's there's guys coming back earlier than that now i know it's wild it has to be a combination of them already being incredible athletes and then taking care of their nutrition and 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 rehab because they're at the facility probably all day when they're when they're hurt on ir and and then good good medical staffs and all that stuff and how hard is that for you to bet like how often do you guys get nicked up and if you miss a day or you're not like completely on board with your with your um, recovery or, or whatever the case may be how easy is that for that uh injury to just linger on for the rest of the season yeah that's football it, it just it happens at every level in high school you get nicked up every game something happens if you're playing physical um in college you do and then in the nfl you definitely do just because the, the sheer size and weight and speed and velocity and force of those bodies moving around is is higher and higher at each level but um it, it's very important to take care of recovery during the season i actually think you have to you have to sleep a lot I, that that is the most important part like not only like i i think guys i think it's underrated for a lot of guys like they don't really take care of realizing how much they need to sleep to recover better so that's kind of one thing i focus on a lot along with the same the other modalities that a lot of people use that in the training room and that kind of stuff to get better and, and tubbing and all those things. But sleep is very, very important. I feel like a lot of people, maybe not necessarily in the sports world, but in like the business world, they're like, yeah, I'll, I'll sleep when I die. And then like they get all sorts of out of whack. You know what I'm saying? And they're very, like, true. very true. Now I haven't quite entered the, the business world yet. <laughs> I'm sure I, I will someday. And I know like people, you know, people in C-level positions are, working long, long hours and, and they have a lot of things to take care of. So, you know, maybe you just can't sleep much. You got, you have to prioritize other things getting done, but um, that's the one thing that playing football has taught me among many things, many life lessons and 
uh, is just value your sleep, value your, your own recovery. And it, it, it aids in your physical and mental abilities during when you're awake, for sure. Mm -hmm. And as far as the mental aspect goes, how soon do you start reflecting on this past season? Um, just in terms of like, okay, I need to improve on this. I did this well, keep doing that. Um, how soon do you start reflecting and kind of like breaking down the season itself? To me, that's more of a in-season thing. Like you, when you're, when you're playing, you watch the film. You tend to watch the film so much. Like not only do you watch it as an offensive line after the game, but you yourself, you want, you want to see how you did out there and, and kind of, I don't know, have, have it either be gratifying for yourself or, and, and momentum building or kind of tearing yourself down. Uh, you try not to do that too much as an offensive lineman because there are going to be mistakes made, right? But, you know, reflecting week to week is one thing. And you have to put it, put it past yourself because there's a game every week. So, you know, you kind of reflect after watching film on, on a Monday and then put it away. And then for me, the big thing is kind of reflecting on the season as a whole. Yeah, I don't really get time until kind of my flight leaving the city that I'm playing. And that always, that's always like a very, it's just an extremely relieving experience. Like you get on the plane, wherever you're going, leaving the season and you're just like, wow, it's over. Another, another season happened. I got through it. Um, and then you kind of reflect on the lessons you learned, whether it was, you know, as a success or a failure or, you know, whether you achieved your goals or not for that year. Yeah. And then, I mean, you kind of brought it up earlier. They just moved it to 18 weeks. Now they added a game, 17th game. How tough is it to go through? Not only that, but preseason, mini camp. Um, I mean, off season programs, all that type of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it makes for a long year, that's for sure. Uh, the nice thing is camp is three weeks now, or there are three preseason games. I guess camp is more like four and a half, five, more like five weeks now. But um, you can kind of avoid the like the marathon camp nowadays with, with the three preseason games. But what ends up happening is, depending on how your team runs its operation and your coaching staff runs, you could have after that third preseason game, there's still some time. It's kind of, they consider it a mini bye week, but you can still be practicing then too. So there's no rest for the weary in, in any time in the NFL. And it's, it is mentally grueling for sure. It, especially, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've actually never started a whole, a full 16 game or 17 game season. I've only played in sparse times throughout the year and made some starts in my career. And I, I feel lucky to have done that, but, but for the, I mean, I mean, I, it's tough to imagine the guys that go out there, you know, every single week and they play 10, 11 year, 12 year careers and you're, and you're starting all those games. So that, that is a lot of uh, miles in the body there. And, and that takes some serious, serious mental toughness to do, to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the best example of that to me is Andrew Whitworth, who's still playing right now. Yeah. He's not even human because I mean, right. playing one of the hardest positions probably on your body yeah. uh, in the, in the league, yeah, left tackle. And then still being at the top of his game after all this time playing in the playoffs on a Super Bowl caliber team. Oh, it's, it's it, when we watch film of the Rams, like any, any team I've been on, you just kind of like as an offensive lineman, like instead of watching the Rams defense, which is terrifying, by the way, <laughs> you just kind of switch onto the, onto the iPad to like watch the Rams offense and kind of, kind of check out Whitworth, what he does. And, and I actually will say, you know, it, you're right. It's an incredible feat and the, all the power to him for doing that. Um, he has figured out a way to play the position in a certain way that he's extremely productive and one of the best at what he does without like he, he moves his body in ways to like avoid some of the wear and tear that you get. And that's, I mean, that's, ex that's extremely savvy. And that's how a lot of guys do get extremely long careers in the NFL. And, and it, it really is, it's cool how, how he, plays just to kind of watch and because things he does like I can't do like his body is is built different than mine you know so um just with that with his physical gifts he has done so well with him and it's fun to it's fun to see that's something that I never really thought of I don't think a lot of fans would think of either just like right. the way you're moving your body even so slightly and it's saving you a year or two i mean i don't know how long it saves you in your career sure. it's almost like it's almost like avoiding right i mean in football you always want to play physically mm -hmm. and that's the name of the game and that's what 
every player prides himself on and what I've prided myself on in my career, along with being smart and being dependable and, and fighting through adversity and all those things, knowing the playbook, but, but like avoiding some physical risks on the field is actually something that some players can try to do to elongate their careers a little bit. I'm not saying it's like taking plays off ever. Um, but it's just like, like I was mentioning with Whitworth, like, it's just, it's kind of like avoiding falling on a guy when you can to, you know, avoid busting your knee up by accident or which is, which is, which you should do, you know, if he wants to play longer. So. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of it honestly ends up in luck because you see, it, I think it was a Bucks game. Two of their offensive linemen got just rolled up on. Yep. Like it just happened. And, and, then and that's probably the, that's probably the biggest aspect of it. Luck is just, yeah. <laughs> luck is a, 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 a big factor in football in a lot of ways. Yep. Who are some of the guys in the league now or or maybe retired that you kind of look at in terms of film and and kind of try to mold your game after? Well, it's funny. I grew up a huge Colts fan, so I, I loved watching those <laughs> O-line guys um, back in the day protecting Peyton. So that kind of like – that made me, you know, proud to be an offensive lineman. Um, I, we can mention all those guys' names. I can't I remember them. I, I can remember them, but we'll move on. But, like, I think, you know – there are so many good players in the league. It's, it's kind of like you take, you see how you kind of watch matchups for me. Like you see really good D lines or really good defensive linemen play. And like you, you watch guys in a game, like play well against those guys. You're like, wow, that's, that's impressive. Like that dude is a good player. And, and I kind of want to watch him more to see how he plays. I think just someone who comes to mind that we played late in the season, we played the Titans the last game, like Roger Saffold actually, He's a Hoosier, right? Went to went to IU. He is an amazing player. He, you know, he's way, way naturally stronger than me. So I can't play the way he plays, but watching him is fun to watch. So any listener here who wants to watch the Titans playoff game here coming up soon, like watch the left guard. And he actually was he played left tackle, I think, for a while with the Rams when he in, earlier in his career. And then he moved, got a little bit older, went inside and left guard, and he just he plays his butt off. He's so powerful and he's always in the right spot at the right time. He, he uses hands really well. So it's, he's, he's a fun player to watch. He plays really hard. Now, growing up as a Colts fan, I don't know if I've ever even asked this to someone. <clears throat> growing up as a Colts fan, obviously being from Indy, what was it like in that, that especially that first game where you're going against like your, your uh, hometown team, the team you grew up rooting for? What's that like? Yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. It was, so that was my first game active again this season uh, was, was week five or six for us, the Texans at, at the Colts. So that was my first time being back in Lucas Oil. I played in high school. I played there twice, uh, but my first time playing a game in the pros at Lucas Oil. And that was, I mean, it was just, it was so cool. It was, it was a dream come true. It was great timing too, because my family was able to come and it, it was a blast. The place is rocking that day because it's kind of always a little bit of a rivalry game. Um, they smashed us that day, but uh, it was it was it was good to see see my family and friends after the game and see them in the stands cheering. And I kind of some of my friends are about half and half cheering for <laughs> Colts and then cheering for me as well. But you know, it's funny like growing up a Colts fan, like it, it, you don't you don't realize how spoiled you are like being an NFL fan. The kids of my generation, we were yeah. so used to that excellence for so long, and it's just it. It is hard to win in the NFL. And the fact that Colts fans had, you know, even even going from Peyton to Luck, like there there were some great years there, great QB play there that you have to always, you know, don't take for granted as a, as a fan because there are teams that we wish they could have that you're for one year, let alone, you know, about 15, <laughs> 20 years. Yeah. You're, you're telling me, dude. Colts Twitter is a cesspool right now. Yeah, <laughs> right. I still follow some of those accounts, but I mean, that was like, they, you know, it was embarrassing that last loss for them for sure at the end of the year, but, and they have some decisions to make um, as a team. They're in a good spot. They just gotta, they gotta find some consistency and, you know, they, they sh like watching their roster on the film they, like they are, you know, there are a few positions away or some consistency at a few positions away from being, the AFC two three seed, you know. So hopefully they can find that and and do well um, for the for my friends and my my family that are Colts fans at least, right? So yeah, that that'd be perfect. Um, you kind of mentioned it a little bit, um, 
how the Rams defense is terrifying. Who who are some of the guys that you've gone up against or you've been preparing for that are like, I don't know, how the hell am I guard this dude by much right? <laughs> yeah, well, that's – it's funny, like, you know, in college when – when you're playing well and you can just, you kind of have some more physical gifts than a lot of people knowing that, you know, the next stage is probably uh, feasible for, for you to attain. At least that's how it kind of was for me for the last two or three years of college. You never were like going into a game, like, well, I just got to try to play hard and, and hopefully things work out, which and, and in the NFL, that sometimes is the case, like no matter how talented you are. Now it's one of those things where it's still football though. So like everyone's, everyone's really good in the NFL. Like there are some players that are better than others, but in the end guys are going to still make some mistakes that they're, they've made all along the way. Some missed assignments or being in the wrong gap at times, or um, maybe not going super hard on some plays. And that's kind of where I tend to take advantage of, of, of guys is kind of like, I'm always going to be consistently in the right spot, doing the right thing at the right time, have, using my hands well, using my feet well, being in front of people always. And so that's kind of how I've made a, a, name in my career um as far as yeah really talented players like i mean aaron donald is is just a league above just for anyone else and i think it's just because he's not made of like the same materials as other humans like it doesn't it doesn't really make any sense um because he's about six one six two two eighty five so he's probably he's most times the smallest defensive lineman out there on the field and it just he's just dominating guys and it's like he's stronger than everybody else he's quicker he's faster so i would put him in a tier on his own still um chris jones the chiefs i think he he he's like he started slow this year but um he's kind of picked it up a little bit i mean he he for a few years there was like kind of right under i thought after when i played for the chargers for four years three and a half years so we saw him a lot that was no fun. Um, I'm going with inside guys right now. Uh, l- last year, played Grady Jarrett. He's had a lot of good years in, in uh, Atlanta for those guys. And he's not a, a very big guy either, but just that natural leverage and strength and quickness off the ball that he has is tough to tough to stop. Mm-hmm. And then you talked about your hands as well. What types of things do you do? I mean, <laughs> I don't want to bring up Aaron Donald again, but he was doing the training with knives and all that crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah, that that seemed, <laughs> that seemed to be a little bit overkill of me. That, that seemed to be a little bit of an Instagram type yeah. video thing. Um, I, I have heard of guys like kind of try to do like some martial arts things with their hands. Um, but for the most part, like the offensive line drills that we do, uh, James Campen who's been my O-line coach the last two years. He's an, an amazing man, um, as good of a coach as he is a man, which is, which is, I think is kind of rare in the industry. Um, so, you know, he, the drills that we do, we actually do a lot of like, we do some tennis ball stuff, catching tennis balls, moving around, like finding them. And it's, it's all about leverage and regaining leverage. So the hand fight in an O-line play is, it's not only violent, but it's about like re-screwing hands. If a guy moves your hand somewhere, you got to always try to get it back inside. And, but it's not just about like sitting there and waiting on guys. You have to attack, even pass, pass protection. You got to attack them and kind of try to set them differently on different plays, just to avoid doing the same thing over and over again. And even on, I mean, you're talking, talking to me about it in like a surface level type, type of way, because obviously I'm, I don't have the expertise that you do, but it is really interesting to hear all the little techniques and things that, especially offensive alignment, defensive alignment that they do to, I mean, try to separate. Right. It, I mean, many things that go along with that, like uh, first is, the game of football is like a bunch of different sports in one. Like there, there, are, every position is like a different sport almost. Like we're never practicing holding, carrying the ball and like avoiding fumbling, right? Which is why when you see an O-line and pick it up, and like as soon as he gets hit, it squirts out somewhere usually, which is sad. But, uh, you know, like and, and receivers, DBs trying to, you know, block on punt protection is like, it's funny because – like they just never learn how to block either. Like special teams is their only time ever trying to like stay in front of somebody. Um, so that's funny. Uh, and, and just like seeing, you know, linebackers play totally different than, than other linemen, you know, it's, it's a different sport essentially. Um, I will say like, if you, as far as like getting into the, the arcana of football, like if you're watching a game and Tony Romo is the, is the color guy, I think Tony is awesome. I think he really, like, he knows so much about the game because he was a good quarterback and he's 
he played quarterback so long and that's the position that you learn pretty much everything. Um, like if he ever notices something happen, like on the offensive and def defensive lines, like while watching a replay, like listen to what he says, because he's extremely knowledgeable about the game. And I think even, you know, every time I watch a game, I learn something about that QB play, like seeing what QBs are looking at when it goes like the behind view of a play. I mean, it's, it's, I think he's super impressive. I think he's a great color commentator and, and can teach even someone like me, but let alone someone who just watches football for fun uh, about the game. So it, it's really good to, to listen to him. Those guys are all super impressive in terms of how they, <clears throat> excuse me, like right after the play, they can break down. I mean, what's going on in all these different things? And I'm like, geez, Louise, man. But when he, when he predicts, when he predicts a play too, is always yeah. pretty funny. He does right. that. I'm watching the quarterback the whole time, and then they're watching. I don't know what they look at. I heard a uh, – I mean, say what you want about him, but I was listening to Dan Dockett the other day, and he was talking about you, why you should watch the line in football, and then he said that Bob Knight, you, he would, like, not watch the ball. Yeah. So, like, I think it's, it's a very similar concept. Yeah, I think yeah. Dockett's spot on there. Yeah. Yeah, but it's – and then football is also an uh, it's a borderline impossible sport to watch and try to grade someone with how they're doing based on like a single play with without the context of what's going on or without the context of like knowing what play they're supposed to run and what their assignment was in that play so you know when you get into like the pff grades and stuff is like that that can be somewhat reflective of how good a player is but it's also it's so much about knowing like, well, what was he taught to do, especially offensive line play? Like there's not stats. So what was the guy taught to do? Is he using the proper technique for what the, what the coaching staff teaches? Is he in the right spot for what they wanted to do in that play? Like is the, is the, did the quarterback make a bad read? So it can be tough to watch a, watch a game, an NFL game and be like, well, our offensive line sucks. But like, you know, maybe the quarterback missed like three different hot calls in that game or the receivers missed the hot routes. And then you have a free running guy hitting the quarterback and is like, well, you know, it's not necessarily the offensive line's fault. So football is a tough sport with that sometimes, but I think Doc is right. Is right there. Yeah. I try to like when I'm reacting to games and stuff like that, I try to stay away from all that type of talk. I mean, but I mean, the offensive line for you guys, you guys all have to be in one cohesive yep. thing moving at the same time. You can't miss a beat at all or else your quarterback is going to get murdered. Yeah, and quarterback is the most important position. But offensive line is pretty important, too, because that's the most – the most players of one group on the field are the offensive line. It's five of your 11 out there up front, and that's the most of any position in football. So you have to really be in sync with each other and, and working to, to achieve the right goals on each play, or otherwise, you know, there's no there's no – success for the whole offense yeah i would say i mean obviously quarterback's the most important position but you guys are the most important position group by far it's not even close yeah i i, I would agree with that yeah but uh i know we're getting close here on time so i want to talk about i mean you going to harvard which is which is so it's so interesting to me just you being able to balance that how did you end up going there yeah so i thought i i Thought I was a little bit under recruited coming out of, out of high school. I went to Ron Colley um, in Indy, and I wasn't super heavy because I played I played basketball too in high school, and so I was I was kind of like probably two sixty my senior year, and I never got a Big Ten offer just because I think they thought I was a little bit too. A lot stronger and a lot better and and a lot bigger, a lot heavier. So. I kind of thought I was a little bit indignant at like not getting recruited uh, very hard by any big 10 schools. And so luckily I had some good, good, I was, you know, appreciated school and, and was interested in doing well in school. So had some good grades, had some good test scores and it came down to Harvard and Princeton for me. Um, and once I visited Harvard, I already knew it was a good program. Like I had kind of watched like growing up, watched my dad, you'd occasionally see the Ivy league game, like the Harvard Yale game on tv at the end of the year and you, like you like i grew up knowing like wow those kids are smart and they're they're doing really cool things off off and on the field so i was aware of like the ivy league but it was never like a goal of mine and so ended up going that route and it came down to harvard and princeton once i visited harvard's 
campus and and met the guys there, I just realized, man, like these are the guys I want to go to school with and and play with, have be my teammates in the future because they're just great dudes, down to earth, fun, witty, really hardworking guys. So, and that's how it was our our whole career there. You know, balancing like work and schoolwork and football was never easy, but um, you know, it's one of those things where like you can try, it's, it's a gen, it's a gen ed there. You have to take eight gen ed courses, um, while you're there. So a lot of guys are like, find a few of the easier gen eds, like during the season, just to, yeah. to make the work a little bit, a little bit lighter during the season and then just grind in the, in the spring. Um, but yeah, like once, once, well, one funny story is when I was getting drafted or when I got drafted to the Cardinals, like I had to, when you get drafted, you go to rookie mini camp, um, at the team that you're drafted to. So I went there. I still graduate though. So I, I went to Arizona, flew to Arizona, flew back to Boston, studied for finals, took some of the finals, flew back to Arizona um, across the country to like start the next like spring camp, uh, the OTA stuff, and then flew back to graduate and then flew back again. So it was, that was a hectic spring. And that's just kind of what it's like at night. It's like, you gotta, you gotta prioritize both school and football. And, you know, we had a lot of fun there too. Like it, you know, most days you weren't going out, but when we, when we could, we made the most of it. So I had, I, I had a ton of fun in college too. There was a, there was a story about Andrew Luck doing something similar to that too, where he came for like mini camp left yeah. and then came back and knew more of the place than, than some of the other. I, I believe that. I believe that. Yeah. Jeez. You guys are built different. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just, if you can, if you get, get good at, like prioritizing your time and time management and just working hard every day on like the tasks you need to achieve that day and looking forward to like what good it's going to give you in the future, what's going to benefit you in the future is kind of how you, how you do it. But, you know, I, I was, I thought about going to military academy. I'm not really from a military family, but I figured, I was going to have a little bit more fun at Harvard, at least than, than some of those places. And I think that's probably true. I mean, all kudos in the world go to guys who go to the military academies, but um, we had a lot of fun in, in college too. So I was, it was a great balance of all three, I think. Yeah. Were the, I mean, don't, don't say nothing bad, but uh, were those Harvard parts, were they just bangers? You guys just throw down. The thing is, is like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But like it was winter for so like Boston's weather is so winter lasts forever. So we pretty much like had about the last three weeks of the school year were the only weeks you could actually go outside and party. So th those three weekends were insane for sure. Um, but then again, like there are so many kids studying all the time that like if you try to throw a party in your own dorm room, it's just going to get shut down within half an hour. So that's kind of the scene is like to go to some of the other places either in boston like the finals clubs that they're there um to do all the partying but yeah there there's some there's some stuff happens at those places <laughs> and what did you major in there i was government with a economics minor so you want to get into politics like uh like our guy anthony gonzalez yeah it's possible i you know like i'm super interested in politics but it's just i don't know it's so toxic nowadays and i feel like you have to sell your soul either way like I think people get into it for the right reasons, but you know, at some point there are all these interest groups that you have to, you have to get elected, let alone actually govern, but getting elected is the most important thing. And once you identify or ally with those social or those special interest groups, it's just tough to like to be yourself, I think anymore. So maybe down the road, but I don't think anytime soon, I need some more life <laughs> work experience first, but maybe hopefully some more NFL experience <laughs> before that. So, no yeah. Um, talking about that i mean i know you posted a picture with cam Brate um yeah. a, while, a while back on on your instagram how close are you with some of the other harvard nfl guys i know the only two off the top of my head are Brate and you Brate and fitz magic and so i will i will add to that here that's this one that we're super, super proud about and I'll, I'll brag about but there were as of last year two years ago there were 10 harvard guys in the nfl and nine of them were from my four years so a few have retired since then, but we still have Fitzpatrick. There's me. There's Juszczyk. You forgot him. All pro, pro bowler, uh, Niners fullback. So he's still in the playoffs. Um, Bray, Ferkser on the Titans, another tight end. Ott is a long snapper. 
for the Seahawks. Um, and then uh, there were a few offensive line guys that that were in that were two of my really good friends. Um, and they're I think they're done. They're pretty much done now. And then Bronicker was a tight end who's one, one of my roommates, another Indiana kid, actually. Um, you can get him on the podcast at some point. Uh, so he was with the Bears for a few years. But we, you know, I think it was still like six or seven this year. Um, crazy. So, yeah, we had a good run of like, no wonder we were good <laughs> for <laughs> when I was at Harvard. Like we had a lot of NFL talent. So and they're all great guys too. Like it's fun getting pictures of them and keeping in touch with them after games. And it's just, it's wild to see that we've come, you know, where, how far we've come in, in a lot of these places. And uh, some of those guys have made way more money and had better careers than me. So <laughs> good for them. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, like, I don't know how many guys off the top of my head, I don't know how many Purdue guys are in the league, but it's, I mean, it's close to 10, you know, it's probably, it's, it might be around that. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's, you guys are popping out NFL guys, uh, like right. like Big Ten schools. Um, All right. Last thing, I mean, what was the draft process like for you coming out of the Ivy League? And, I mean, obviously you had all the accolades um, at the FCS level. What was it like for you to go through the draft process and and maybe be overlooked to a certain degree but, but still get that opportunity? Yeah, for me, I didn't really worry about that. It was just – the best thing that happened for me was um, I'll preface it by saying like, if you're good, they'll find you. Like that's, that's a saying you hear a lot, but the NFL team scouting departments are so big. Like they obviously know the Ivy like there, there are way more obscure places that players come from that it's like impressive that they find that talent. So I knew I was going to get scouted and I had no issue with that. Um, I had a really good agent. I signed with, with an agent. I'm still with today. And the best thing that happened for me was he got me into the senior bowl. So that was kind of the best thing that he did for me with his kind of his connections. And I think they were already kind of looking at me, but with him it's it's funny, but like with signing with him, he would kind of knew the senior bowl director and essentially got me a spot in that game. And that was big for my draft status. Um, but that's kind of how that stuff works is it was an interesting process. Like I, I came home for winter break of my senior year after the season and then started doing combine training, which your agent, your agency pays for, which is kind of interesting, uh, which is, which is cool. I did it, it at St. Vincent in Indy uh, mm-hmm. and then went back to school and then started doing combine training with the strength staff at Harvard there. And it's a pretty stressful process. Like it's, you know, like, like I said, a theme of this is there's no rest for the weary. Like after your senior year college, you just want to have fun, but no, we had to keep, we had to keep working hard and keep grinding in the weight room because the next step was, was in front of us there. And it was going to be the hardest step yet, but those were good times too. Like, like I said, there were, there were a few Harvard guys with me that year that were going to go pros as well. So we had a good crew to work out there every day back at Harvard. And then um, draft day was awesome. It was, was one of the best days of my life. And then it throws you into a whirlwind again, like I was saying with traveling back and forth to Arizona and back to Boston, but that was a, that was a great time. It's it's an exciting time in one's life, and there's just so much unknown and uncertainty. But also, like you know, it's going to be a lot of a lot of fun. You know, it's going to be really cool. It's what you've worked for, right, your whole life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you kind of touched on it, but you can't can't stay comfortable, especially in right. in that in that profession. I guess with everything. I mean, yeah. You're just done with the season. Now you got to prepare for next season. And I mean, you signed with Harvard. And now you're thrown into the deep end right. of that and, and everything right. like that. But, right. Yeah, so obviously this this upcoming weekend is the divisional round in the playoffs. Um, I know you played the Titans. I don't know. I don't. You, and then you played the Rams and the Niners. I don't know if you played the other teams. Um, on the AFC side, what are you looking at for in the Bengals-Titans game? I actually was – before that we talk about the matchups, like I was super excited for the playoffs to watch the playoffs this year. Obviously I wanted to be a part of them, but you gotta be realistic. If it's, just, if it doesn't happen, it's still kind of fun to watch football. I think. Um, Cause I think any team could win the championship this year. Like the, the Packers can demolish anybody, but the Packers can also lose anybody, I think. And then the Titans are absolutely beatable. Now they're a very tough team, an extremely old school physical team with a lot of good players but like that's a beatable team. That's a team that that we beat yeah. in a in a in a rainstorm earlier this year. So um, yeah, who are the? It's it's Bengals. I was excited to see the Bengals get a win. Good for that city. I have a good friend from college who's from Cincinnati. So good for the people of Cincinnati. A lot of frustration there for a long time. 
Um, the Bengals have to try to manage that run game is what it is. Like Titans offensive line is really good, really physical. They play well together. They can struggle a little bit in pass pro sometimes. So yeah. if they can get some pressure on, on uh, the quarterback, Titans quarterback, then I think they might be able to do well because he's not super comfortable in a lot of, with a lot of pressure, but they don't want to pass the ball. So if the Bengals can get up a lot, two scores and make them pass a lot of the game, then, then they're in a good spot. But if the Titans are up 14, 10 points the whole game, they can run the clock and run the ball. They're in a good spot. And it's tough to get them out of that spot because they got a good defense too. Uh, 98, that's, we talked about office or defensive linemen. Um, Simmons, 98, I hadn't really played or seen much of before going to the Texans this year. Mm-hmm. He's a really good player too. He's, he's a top five D tackle in the league for sure. Yeah, I thought, I mean, he was going to go top five. Top ten in the draft, maybe yeah. even top five, and then he got hurt. And he kind of fell to them, and yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it all depends on how how Derrick Henry looks. He, I mean, even without without him, their run game was very good. Is he playing? Is he going to play? I think so. Yeah. Dude, what a freak! <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> so that's very scary because like that him coming back will also galvanize that team like crazy. Just just the phenomenon and like the, the feel around the team, the aura of him coming back is going to, is going to make them, I think, feel really good. So I guess I didn't realize he was going to be back this soon. I, I knew he was like, he was oh, they practicing. Activated him. practicing. Okay. So whew, that's scary. I mean, you want to talk about a dude that's not human. That dude. Yeah. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah. Like, two, what? Six four two fifty. Yeah, he's he's legit six four on the field. It's crazy. I mean, he looks even like with the helmet on, he looks even taller than six four on yeah. the field. It's like this guy's a running back. Oh my god. Yeah, he's bigger than a lot of the linebackers now. Yeah, he is. He, he is the linebackers, honestly. I would say so. Yeah. And then I mean, next matchup, Bills and Chiefs. That's going to be a barn burner in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I always think like the Bills run Josh Allen so much, like. If I was a, a Bills fan, well, one of my roommates from college is a huge Bills fan, but like I was then like just pray every time he runs the ball, just stay healthy. Like, don't get up hurt. Because they run him so much. I, it's like it blows my mind that they do that. Now it's it's an extremely effective play because you have an extra blocker and you they the defense doesn't have anybody to account for him. But I think if Josh stays healthy, they got a good shot. Um, the Chiefs were very beatable earlier earlier in the season, but now they're looking back to Chiefs form and their offense is so fun to watch because they just do the craziest stuff, like stuff that you just don't see offenses do. And it's like, it's just, it's kind of like you just see some backyard type type stuff, but like it's executed, which is just, it's fun to watch, I think. Yeah. Do you prefer, or like Lyman across the league or you personally, do you prefer playing in like a, a run heavy offense or a, a- gunslinger type offense like the Chiefs kind of have uh it kind of depends on what type of player you are like if you're if you're a physical downhill guy that's not necessarily the best pass protector then obviously you want to be a part of a running offense um if you're a good pass protector you want to you want to play to your strengths now like you know if you're starting on offensive line you're not going to complain either way and what the offense is like um but as offensive line it's very it's relieving to not like pass for like Pass plays, especially on third down in the NFL, are very stressful. So <laughs> to avoid like being on third and longs all, all game is just pretty much the most important psychological part as offensive line. To avoid having the crowd, especially if you're away, like how did the crowd go crazy? Got to go silent count, tap the center, look back <laughs> at the quarterback. Um, that's that's brutal. And then just having all those, those freaks on the D-line do their picks and twists and guys blitzing all over the place. So you want to avoid that's the one thing you want to most avoid at all costs. Like if you're if you're passing out of second and six all game, no problem with that. Um, but it is it's funny how different schemes are very different. Like it's I think it would be fun to play in the Chiefs offense for sure, because they, they do a lot of, of interesting stuff and they get some guys out in space too, uh, offensive linemen out in space doing some some fun things. So it's a fun offense to watch. No doubt. And then um last two games we can do that quickly is Packers 49ers that's a rematch and then Bucks and Rams just another rematch both phenomenal games in my opinion yeah I think if if the Bucks O-line isn't healthy this game I think the Rams I think the Rams are going to do what the Bucks did to everyone in the NFC 
and the Super Bowl last playoffs. It's just like they didn't play a starting offensive tackle for the last two or three weeks, which is like, man, you got – it's tough to have any shot in those games when you get down to a team you got to pass all game. So the Rams can do that this week to the Bucs. It's possibly going to happen. I mean, never discount Tom Brady mm-hmm. and a team he plays on. Um, and then what was uh, – Packers, Niners. I think Packers, but – because I, I kind of want to see Rodgers get another one, but man, the Niners are the same. The Niners are the same team as the Titans, only with a little bit more of a um, interesting offensive scheme. Like they do a lot of things that build off of that outside zone bootleg action, which that's a fantastic offense to be an offensive line in. Because when you run bootlegs, you just got to run in a direction, and the quarterback pulls it. You got nothing else to do. You let him <laughs> let him go. So that's a beautiful offense to be in, and I'm looking forward to seeing my buddy Juice. Uh, play fullback this weekend and hopefully catch a few passes, maybe run, run for a touchdown. But I think if the, if the Packers get up on them, they're fine, but the Niners are a good team, man. When they can, when they can run the ball and if they can get up seven or 10 or 14 on them, like that game is just so shortened at that point. So. And then last thing, I mean, if, if you had to pick one now, Super Bowl champ. I think Packers are going to do it. Same. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah, I was kind of hoping for just for my own selfishness, just Packers uh, Bengals. Just thought that'd be an interesting matchup, and I think the Bengals could do it. But you know, it's tough. It's gonna be tough to beat the Chiefs or Bills if they if they get past this round. No doubt. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm gonna wrap this thing up. I, I really appreciate you coming on. And for sure, man, it's good to good conversation and being open and honest and, and teaching me a lot about football. <laughs> behind the scenes really appreciate for it sure. for sure yeah thanks for having me yes sir have a good one you too see you man